So uh, welcome, welcome everybody. We're gonna share with you some of our thoughts and projects and ideas around decolonizing beyond the objects. And um, if I'm not mistaken, we're four minutes on our time, so we should start. And I'm gonna share very quickly my, my screen and, um, and please um, all my dear colleagues, as you start talking and sharing your things, please do a brief introduction about yourself. And if you're joining us in this Zoom room, please join us on the chat saying your name, your location and your institution. And good afternoon, good, uh, everybody, or good evening. My name is Amparo Leimantino, I am the um, and I'm an education consultant on DAI. I am the principal of my very little company called Yellow Crown Consulting. And today I'm here with three amazing colleagues with whom I've been working for the past two years on conversations and learning from them of how we decolonize our institutions. In the past summer, this summer 2021, we, we were participating at the uh, European Network of Science Centers and Museums Conference, uh, talking about decolonization beyond the objects. And we had a um, melange of uh, a festival of organizations and how they work and partner with countries in the Southern Hemisphere to really push forward the, the agendas on, on decolonization. So we have people from Haiti from um, Africa, working with people in Europe or in the US with the indigenous communities in the US. Um, said so, I would like to uh, describe myself for those of you that cannot um, be present with your site. I am dark, dark hair, I have, um, I'm brunette with a wavy hair that right now looks really horrible. I'm wearing glasses because I reached that age where you need glasses to read. And I'm wearing a, a dress that has big black circles on, on an off-white uh, um, background. And I'm wearing uh, a necklace that was made by my friends. And it's made of, uh, in Spanish, we call perlas de rios, which are pearls that are, are um, found in rivers in Mexico. That's my country of origin, Mexico. And coming from that Southern hemisphere and living here in the US in California where I'm based, I would like to share with you why it's important to restore the relationships. Decolonizing um, is not only the restitution of objects in our, in, um, from museums or colonizing museums, but it's also the restitution of relationships and how these relationships are connected to and with uh, these communities to move aside the narr narratives of dominant uh, cultures or the colonizers. So there's also the uplifting of science that comes from our ancestors. So in, the, in, in particular, from my country of origin, Mexico, where most of the things that we do is to rescue, for example, the knowledge from our indigenous groups, the Mayans, the um, Otomis, the Huicholes, and how we incorporate those things into the programming, into the new narratives. And that, of course, comes with other decolonization of science when we incorporate other languages indigenous languages and, and bilingual, multilingual interpretation. So uh, partnerships are part of the co-creation and the uh, and empowerment of these communities. And I, it's not me, but my other colleagues who are gonna talk about better examples of how can we reach this, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, uh, screen and how can we um, reach these goals. So it's my absolute pleasure now to share the microphone to my colleague, Anna Sheffers. Um, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ampis. Um, so as Ampis said, my name is Anna Schaefers. Um, I work with the State Museums in Berlin. I'm a curator of education. 
Um, I am a white person. I've got short blonde hair. I'm wearing a dress that my mom made for me and a jacket that I knit myself. Um, and it's 11.15 in the evening for me. So bear with me if at some point I look a bit tired, but I've got enough adre adrenaline for all of you, um, I hope. So um, I work with the state museums and I specifically work with the Museum of Ethnology and the Museum of Asian Art. These two museums closed their doors in 2017 and just reopened a month ago. Well, not even that, it reopened on the, on the 23rd of September. So I'm going to share with you some do's and don'ts of reopening specifically the Ethnological Museum because I think that's slightly more interesting, perhaps here, easier to talk about um, in 2021. So um, what I think is a great do thing you should do is acknowledge the problematic origins of your collections, um, which is something that the curators talked about a lot and acknowledged in, in the, the text that they wrote for the exhibitions. I'm the one who is proofreading, editing all those texts. Um, but what they didn't do, and what I think would have been important for them to do, is acknowledge um, the past of those collections and the, the fault that lies with those museums in collecting the, the exhibits um, in kind of, let's say, big text. So let's say having a text at the introduction in, in the introductory room saying, this is what we did and we have to say sorry and we have to give things back. This was all in, in the way that the museum produces things was all seemed more like a reaction and an afterthought. So good things could be done there. Um, another good thing that happened was that um, sensitivity readers were invited to have another look at the texts um, to see if they were, let's say, post-colonial enough, if there was sexism in there somewhere to, to just have another look at the content and have a see if that was sensitive enough. Um, what you shouldn't do is do that six weeks before the opening when the texts are already on the walls and do that without actually talking to the creators but just have the sensitivity readers come and say this is bad this is bad this is bad and then turn the curious and now you're going to change it all six weeks before the opening. No fun. Um, the image that you're seeing here um, is of the installation Indignation by the Cameroonian artist Justine Gaga. Um, and it was specifically made for the exhibition. So I think it's a good idea to not only show ethnological objects, whatever an ethnological object may be, um, but to also ha have um, current contemporary positions of artists um, shown in the exhibition to pay them actually to show us these things. Um, the thing that went wrong here was that Justine Gaga was invited to the great opening with uh, our Bundespräsident, so the highest ranking politician in Germany, and they didn't make extra sure that she was on the list for the Federal Criminal Police Office, so those are the people who check that everyone's who, who's going to see the president is actually not going to kill him or do other things. Um, and it was very hard for her to get in because she wasn't on that list. Embarrassing, not, not a good, not good look. Um, and then, <clears throat> of course, if you open a new exhibition in the country's biggest cultural project in the last couple of years, the building cost 680 million euros, so it's a lot of money that went into rebuilding a Prussian palace, which is a whole other bunch of questions we might ask. Um, you want to advertise for this opening uh, nationwide, but if your curators tell you this image that you see here um, is really not a good idea because it combines all these different objects of people from the global south, making them into one, let's say, hyper native, hyper indigenous person, and your curators tell you, do not publish this image. This is going to produce very bad press. Believe in them. We could have avoided this. I hope I'm allowed to say this word shitstorm. 
Um, so I'm happy to talk more about what went right, what went wrong, and what we should all learn. Thank you very much. I'm giving over to Gabby. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Gabi Gabriel from Futurium in Berlin, where I'm head of um, exhibitions. So Futurium is a, a, also a new museum in Berlin, and it's, an, it's more like an exhibition space, um, which shows, uh, let's say, pathways into different futures. So we don't have objects, we don't have all this historical um, uh, things we, we are looking to the future. Um, I'm very proud to, to speak in this session also about a future project. So uh, it's challenges and the fears and the hopes we are planning in it. And I will sh um, sh share my screen with you. This um, project is about African futures in Futurium in Berlin. So um, I will start with a very short chronology of, of the project. Um, the first idea came in 2017. So Futurium itself opened in 2019. So two years before um, we opened the house. Um, the, it was the first idea, my first idea to make an African futures exhibition. So a special exhibition. Um, as a start of a series of special exhibitions at fut um, about futures from non-European perspectives in, in Germany and Berlin. Um, 2018, we started focusing, so we were still um, preparing um, the opening of the house with the main exhibition and um, beside oh, parallel, we were focusing already on other goals um, on these um, special exhibitions. Um, and the idea was, or the focus was to, to increase awareness um, of our audience, of our German audience and to the tourists coming to Berlin, to increase awareness for the future challenges and options for solutions in other parts of the world and to increase awareness for the connection in a globalized world, though the connection between Europe in this case, and let's say the rest of the rest of the world. <laughs> um, so it, we, we continued our work and then we had this, um, yeah, postponement um, due to Corona and other reasons in 2020 and 20 one, we started rethinking this project because in the meanwhile, the post-colonial discourse picked up speed and we had ongoing debates about the Humboldt Forum. Um, so Anna was talking about <laughs> um, this very huge institution. Um, and we had on also not only in Berlin with this Humboldt Forum, but we learned linguistic clarifications in many cases. So um, and distinctions we didn't know in, in Germany. So like B Park Park. So this was really new for, uh, for most of us. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement became more important even in Germany. Um, and we discussed about critical whiteness. So, uh, uh, a bunch of new um, topics we, we didn't, let's say, not new for, for, for people who were who working in this part of, um, of culture, um, but um, for, for the big audience, it was quite new. And um, then with the inauguration ceremony of Joe Biden, we had this um, great poem of Amanda Gorman, and it was translated in some parts of Europe um, by, by white translators and the publishers. So the publishers decided to invite white translators. And this brought us to a new sort of discussions about who is allowed, or who uh, can translate such a poem. And this 
brought us and our team to rethink our project and to think, yeah, if these white translations or translations by white people um, don't work for this example, um, what about white exhibitions? Would this work? And is this possible even if we say, okay, we, we translate non-European perspective, uh, we, we invite non-Europeans to, to talk about their perspectives. Um, is this still a good idea? And then we came over in Cobra, we had many discussions also with Elizabeth, uh, who is with us today. Um, and came to, to the questions like, how can we make decolonize our approach? So the planning of this exhibition, how can we talk about uh, without making mistakes because this fear increased and more and more we, we were thinking about the project. And of course, how can we avoid unconsciousness violations? So this, these were the main questions which um, arise with the, let's say, the development of this um, future project. And I give over to, to Elizabeth. The floor is yours, yours. Elizabeth. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Uh, it's also late for me here uh, in, uh, in South Africa, in the Southern Hemisphere. So I'm going to try and uh, keep going. Um, thanks to my colleagues uh, who've spoken already. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Rasekwala. I'm from African Gong, which is a Pan-African network for the popularization of science and technology and science communication. and. Uh, we started off uh, working to advance uh, the science communication agenda, practice um, an impact on the African continent. But uh, we soon realized that um, we couldn't just uh, focus on our continent. We had to engage uh, with uh, activities in the global north because we are sitting in a, in a continent just as with other regions in the global south, uh, where we have a long-standing um, legacy of uh, Eurocentric uh, hegemonic dominance in our science system, in our science education, and also in terms of the practices of science communication. So we realized that we had to work on a number of fronts so you're dealing with the enemy within as well as the enemy without, for want of a better word. So hence, uh, there's, there's a very strong international element to the work that we do. But we also see our international work as, as, a, as, as work of solidarity because, um, you know, there, there are many well-intentioned colleagues in the global north who want to do things differently, who want to see transformation happen. And that can only happen in partnership, as um, uh, Amparo was saying in the beginning of this session. So partnerships for us is a very important part of how we see decolonization happening. Uh, and so in the case of, of uh, Gabby's um, Futurium and the African Futures Project, that was something that we felt that it would be very transformative for us to partner with. So when we talk about partnerships, with, we're asking the question, how can science centers or museums move forward the decolonization agenda in their practices, exhibits, and narratives through equitable, transformative, and paradigm-shifting partnerships with communities from which their exhibits have been extracted in the colonial era or in the case of the Futurum, trying to uh, uh, create a future, a vision in solidarity that will overcome and turn around in a positive way those historical um, um, negatives. So you can either look at it from those fronts. 
And I basically, we, we basically look at this on two pillars. The first pillar is to say, partnerships are all well and good, but the cautionary tale is good intentions are not enough. We've all been here before, we, we, we have experience. So the nature of these partnerships, even when they're initiated with goodwill on both sides, we know that they are fraught with potential pitfalls of unequal power dynamics, trust, and pseudo-historical memory. Pseudo-historical memory is one of the biggest challenges that we have to the decolonization agenda. Um, and it's something that needs to be addressed on both sides. So these partnerships can also be bedeviled with challenging issues of ethical ownership. Who owns what? Where did the objects come from? Where do the narratives come from? Where do the stories come from? Um, challenging issues of belonging and belonging not just in a physical sense, but belonging in terms of memory, in belonging in terms of, of, of the cultural uh, uh, context in which this sits, issues of access and issues of sociocultural inclusion. So at the heart of the disjuncture, is the need to interrogate and overturn the dominant Eurocentric historical and contemporary perspectives of scientific knowledge and its inclusive science communication. So that is the one side of the pillar that speaks to good intentions are not enough. The other side of the pillar speaks to another cautionary tale uh, aspect, which is you must look before you leap. Look before you leap. Key signposts. What are the key signposts posts that need to be in place uh, potentially to signpost that there are potential positive outcomes and uh, indicators that uh, 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 can be achieved? So you really need to look for these signposts before you leap into these partnerships. So the first one is, does the uh, Science Center or Museum, do they have a racially diverse staffing profile from the background of the communities where the exhibits are extracted or the communities that they wish to share, uh, they engage in partnership with? So it's very critical. And this is one of the elements that came from the case study of the uh, Museum of Us uh, that, we, that was shared with us uh, in our session at Excite in the summer. So a racially diverse staffing in the institution itself is a critical signpost to the potential positive outcomes in partnerships. So the second one then asks, does the Science Center or Museum, does it have a sustainable institutional transformative framework in place to engender systematic change? Or is this partnership simply a cynical public relations exercise? And we need to ask those questions because you do not just want to be involved in a gimmick or a tokenistic exercise. How systematic and how institutionally embedded is the framework in which this partnership will sit? The third uh, uh, element is, does the Science Center or Museum give equal voice and representation to the communities in the partnership to facilitate their equitable engagement in it, or does it simply wish for a light touch tokenistic engagement? Again, we have seen bad examples of this elsewhere. Absolutely. The fourth element is, does the Science Center or Museum allocate adequate resources in terms of funding, time, infrastructure support, visibility, and so on to its community partners so that they are fully able to operate from a position of strength? Or is it simply interested in engaging in a superficial box ticking exercise with limited outcomes? So you cannot talk about a partnership where 
one partner is well resourced and one other partner isn't. That itself is, 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 is a recipe for inequality going forward. And resources, as I said, it doesn't just mean funding. Resources can mean time. A big institution with many staff can undertake an initiative in three months, whereas a community-based partner with limited staff would probably need six months. Are you with me? To achieve the same outcomes. Is that institution prepared to give that time, the latitude of time to the community partner? So these are critical questions and signposts. So in summary, uh, when we talk about these partnerships, it's very clear that the way forward lies in science centers and museums, which understand the profound nature of decolonization partnerships with communities as being premised on a sustained institutionalized commitment to systematic and continuous action in a dynamic forward moving trajectory and inculcating processes which transformatively engage with the ever present exclusionary and disenfranchising legacy of colonialism in the scientific enterprise and its communication. So the message here is that this is not a snap exercise. It needs to be embedded in sustainable systematic frameworks, but it needs to be seen as a continuous loop. You move forward, you learn, you make mistakes, you move forward again. It's incremental. It has to be forward driven. So anybody who comes into this looking for quick answers, looking for snap solutions, that really is a sign that you are not serious about what it is that you're undertaking. It's a process, it's a journey, and it's a journey that has to keep being pushed forward. And that needs to happen on both sides. So partnerships for restitution, absolutely critical, but good intentions are not enough and you must look before you leap. And the way forward is institutional systematic commitment, forward looking. Thank you.